with them besides use them as schools. The third reason is Parkside is a structured elementary school with, with designated classrooms. They, it's my understanding from what I heard the other night, they wanted to move those children to uh, Cache Valley, which is an open space school. We found out years ago that open space schools are really not the best way to go. Uh, so I would be totally opposed to it. Thank you. Wayne Foote. Yes, thank you. Teacher of 42 years, 36 here in Allegheny County, born and raised in Lone County. I could tell you many stories about consolidation that happened from Western Port all the way to Mount Savage. When I retired in 2005, built my dream house, a couple of principals asked me to get on the sub list. I did do that. I subbed for four years and I saw good things going on. One thing I wanted to make sure of was Mountain Ridge doing what it was supposed to do after consolidating all of those communities. Yes, it was. It was a solid school. I've drawn a lot of dollar bills on this little scratch pad, people. It's all about money. Here we have a railroad system that is pulling completely out. We have no large employers in this county anymore. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure out that you, at, at one time we had eight high schools in Allegheny County, and we're now down to three with the Career Center. So someplace down the line, I don't know if it will be this next school board that's elected, but something's going to have to be done along those lines. I don't like to see elementary children being transported long distance from their homes. I think there's a way that we can change boundary lines and we can get the ratio that me being on the present school board, we're trying to shoot for a ratio of 18 to 1, 18 students to uh, one teacher in those lower grades so they get the adequate education that they need. So there's going to be a lot that's going to need to be addressed with this new school board and definitely I feel you have to have community input. And after all, election is, you're elected by the people for the people. You are doing what the people want to be done in the county. So along those lines, um, thank you. So good luck. All, everything's been covered. I don't know what you're okay. going to cover now. Thanks so much. <laughs> Deborah Frank is next. Deborah? Thank you. I had the opportunity last week to attend the first of many public sessions regarding redistricting um, the schools. I had a lot of my questions answered, but still have some that I want answered. Um, I, I'm all about community schools, but I, I'm very aware of the fact that the Cumberland, or not Cumberland, Allegheny County's population has declined and shifted. Um, in the forum, they pointed out the underusage of many of the school buildings that, that are currently in operation. Um, looking at a school, for example, like uh, Westmar with less than 50% usage, we have to be open to different options. So I would never support closing a school or consolidating schools without consideration given to the community impact, teacher re reassignment, uh, transportation issues, those have been mentioned and certainly class size. Um, at the forum, we really didn't get a whole lot of information about the impact on class size. We were assured that teacher reassignment would be a given. Um, so to answer the question, how do I feel about it, it's really up to what the community supports. And as I said, that was the first of many public sessions that are planned. Now, in answer to the second part of the question about two high schools, I'm assuming the consolidation of Fort Hill and Allegheny, it's my understanding that that would not be feasible with a new high school. It's not large enough to accommodate both of those. Um, we seem to keep forgetting about Mountain Ridge being in this area also. Um, so I, I don't even think that that's something worth discussing at this point, but if it's a, if it's a matter of looking at um, better usage, usage of facilities and being very mindful of the fact that schools are the center of most communities and if there's minimal impact on transportation, um, you know, we've got to be open to ideas. So I would certainly be open to, to the idea of it, but would listen to the constituents as these uh, public forums roll out. Thank you. Our next candidate to answer will be Nicholas Hadley. 
Well, when the redistricting study was actually brought up, I was a little concerned because redistricting is something that probably needs to be done because we have some students that are attending schools from the same street to different schools. Redistricting to me though is something completely different than closing. When you're talking about closing schools, you're talking about devastation to those communities, you're talking about devastation to the economic development, you're talking that it just drains everything out of that community. I lived through consolidation many years ago as a student, I then saw it as the mayor of a town and then we're sitting here again at potentially seeing it close again. Uh, I would be totally 100% opposed to closing any of those schools. Um, I too sat through the forum that was presented the other day and I didn't see where there was con con conclusive information that said that we should be closing these schools. Uh, I see that there was overcapacity at Westmar, but I don't think that that says or is the reason why we just say let's go ahead and close the school just because we got a little extra space. So I think we need to look at the community impact. Most importantly we need to see how it's going to affect the students overall because that's what we're here for. We're here to do what's in the best interest of the students and the community as well as what is the best education possible for these students. Community schools as the others have said is definitely the way to go and I would back that up 100%. Now with that being said, on the high school level, I have seen where it has worked out very well, where Mountain Ridge is a fantastic school that has been consolidated with numerous high schools. If there was any way feasible that we could put the two, Allegheny and Fort Hill together, I wouldn't be opposed to that, but I think that's going to be way down the road, and I think that that is something that would impact studies, classes, and sports courses. So we'll see how that works and plays out, but right now it's the focus on the elementary school. Thank you. Our next candidate is Carmen Jackson. Hello. Um, my concern about school closings is we shouldn't close them. Uh, we need to look at um, the effect of a school closing, not just through the lens of the Board of Education or our educational system, but we need to consider our local officials, our local politicians, uh, and the impact on the community. The impact when you close a school in a community, you lose to the community the, um, the income from the teachers, custodians, every facet of the institution. And that, that, de that deteriorates the community. The building is sitting there empty. We need to t take our schools and make them community centers. We're always talking about the opioid problem here in our community. Well, we need to give our students something else to do and every community can come up with ideas for their community about how we can better use those schools, keep the funding in the community, and work together to help our youth. We cannot think of this problem in isolation. Thank you. Morgan Mayer. Echoing a lot of what the other candidates have said, um, I do believe that elementary schools are extremely crucial to a community. They're the heart of communities, especially in our small towns. Um, I would hate to see either Parkside or Georges Creek close. Um, that's not something that I, I would want to see. However, I do think that the most important part here is gaining community input and making sure that we're making well-informed decisions. Um, I do agree that a lot of the district lines don't make sense. Um, and this study originally started as looking at redistricting, and I, I still think that that needs to be done. Um, but that does not mean closing schools by any means. Um, in terms of Allegheny and Fort Hill, I was actually a student member of the board in 2012 when the decision to build the new Allegheny High School was voted on. Um, and during that feasibility study, the, the consulting firm looked at consolidating the high schools and building a new school for two Cumberland high schools, and that was not concluded to be the best possible option. The reasoning was um, they projected population trends for years out in Cumberland, and there has been um, drops in the school populations, but it's, it's very marginal. Um, it's not large percentages that the, the population is dropping. Um, if you look at the current population of the high schools, Allegheny is right at 670. Um, Fort Hill is right at 
770 and Mountain Ridge is hovering around 820. Um, so if you're looking at consolidating Cumberland schools, that's going to give you one school with 1,500 students and one school with about 1,800 students. And that just doesn't make sense, um, especially when you're thinking about student to teacher ratio and classroom size. Um, so I, I don't think that that is something that needs to be addressed at this time. Thank you. Jim Robertson. The use of the word consolidation is kind of uh, harsh when it comes to Allegheny County. When money is being spent to have these uh, um, programs addressed in regards to do we need to, do we not need to, and why, that comes back from a third party telling us that there is this and this is what their suggestions are. Community input is very important, but I wish that I could sit here and tell you that I had the money and the knowledge and to know how to cut this program, cut that program, or cut this program to keep one school or two schools open. We're sitting here tonight, at least I am, to try to make it that the students that go to these elementary schools has the best of everything. If they have to go a mile further or a mile less and get a better education, that is my concern. That's my deep concern. Money is the problem. We've lost uh, uh, the windmills, which was going to be $900,000 a year coming in the county. If you've seen the newspaper three weeks ago, there was three full pages of tax money not paid into the county yet. That's money. So when we're asking, where are we going to get it? I wish I had it to give, but we don't. And we can only, their, ta their, their tax and uh, their checkbook is the same as mine. You can only write a check if you got the money in there to back it up. That is the ultimate goal, is to make sure that these students and children have the best that they can have. As far as the high school is, is, con is concerned, I think the students are more apt to that than it is the parents. The parents seems to be the problem in any uh, uh, getting together when it comes to education. If it wouldn't be for the businesses and the uh, Board of Education and the Chamber of Commerce getting together to have programs in, in place that don't cost the taxpayer nothing, we'd be further not ahead but further behind when it comes to some of the programs we have with that. So to worry about high school, let's try to worry about saving the middle schools because they're not there to high school yet. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, may I bring something up, rebuttal what okay, you very said good. there? Uh, sure. About when you consolidate Fort Hill and Allegheny. Uh, Wayne Foot. You, you would not have a large number going into that high school. You would change the district line so so many of them would be going to Mountain Ridge. And I did some thinking about just talking to some people. You would have two 3A schools that would be well under 1,500, around 1,400. One of the biggest problems now is trying for our teams like Fort Hill to play football teams. They don't want to play us. If you would become a 3A school, the high school in Cumberland, if you would have one, you could play the schools in Washington County and Frederick County. So you would have to divide it up so you would have two high schools about the same size. Thank you. Okay, thank you. We move on to our next question. And before we go to Kathy Getty, I'm going to say we're going to start with Bob Farrell this time around. We're going to skip over one and then everybody will get a chance to start. But I want to give Bob a heads up. <laughs> Kathy, your question. Traditional bullying in the schools is still a major problem and in recent years that has expanded to cyberbullying. What are your solutions? I wish I had a solution. Uh, bullying is a terrible thing for children to go through. I dealt with it when I worked in the schools. Uh, they came up with different programs where they're to be reported and the uh, folks are supposed to, the, the uh, people in the, cent in the office, the central office, and the state are supposed to be notified and a record cap of persons being bullied or whatever. Um, things have changed. The cyberbullying, once you put something on the internet, it's there forever. And kids just don't seem to understand that. And it, I think that that is one of the large causes of school violence. Uh, I've seen it numerous times where, you know, it caused different uh, altercations. Uh, and I do think that that is probably one of the generators also of some of the school shootings. Uh, there have been incidents in Allegheny County that I personally investigated where students had, uh, you know, hit lists for 
uh, things that, you know, because of things that happened to them because they were bullied. And I truly, um, I don't know the answer. I wish I did. I think probably more counseling, more counselors. Um, and whenever we did the study a couple years ago after the Connecticut shooting, we there was supposed to be a plan where uh, counselors were supposed to be brought in from the health department. There was another faction of the security plan. My job in that was to provide, to, to figure a way to have more security in the school. There was another half of that where they were supposed to contact the health department and the health department was to provide counselors. I don't think the other half of that ever came into place. And I do think that counselors and people talking to these kids and I think having good, good guidance is probably one of the best solutions. Wayne, Wayne Foote. Back in my day of starting to teach down in Prince George's County back in the early 60s, all the way up until 2000, I saw very few problems with bullying. You had discipline in the schools, you had respect. We hit that new millennium and everything went helter skelter. I made it my point, like I told you, I went out and subbed. My first sub job over at Allegheny dealt with this instrument here. I had taken the attendance, English class. In my days, eyeballs were on eyeballs. I went out to address the class. All I saw was the tops of heads. I said, ladies and gentlemen, I'd appreciate if you'd put those devices away. Young man on the front row says, who do you think you are? In my day of teaching, Hello, hallelujah. I don't know what would happen. I said, what did you say? Our teacher lets us do anything. This thing has to be controlled in the classrooms. It's causing all kinds of problems with kids talking about kids. I have a granddaughter at Fort Hill who has gone through all kinds of bull. I'll leave the last word off. Also down in the middle school, Washington, problems developing over cell phones. These kids will say anything and everything, even parents getting into it. I even know a case where a parent who was a teacher got into uh, a situation with a young lady who was a cheerleader because her daughter didn't make captain. So we control this, we can control a lot of things. Boeing, we need to give more power to our administrators. There needs to be a consequences with problems today. Student A commits a problem. He goes to timeout. He goes to the academic village. He gets put back in the classroom. Same thing over and over and over. These teachers have to put their extra time in giving work to these kids in these classrooms. That's one reason why teachers are saying it's not fun to teach anymore. They That's don't it. have time to teach. Thank you. Thank you. Deborah Frank. Thank you. Cell phones, social media, all of those have created problems. In, in my 30 years of teaching, I've seen a progression. Uh, bullying has always been an issue, but social media has made it that much worse. And I, I can't believe I'm about to say this, but I think at the elementary level, we need to start looking at talking to students about the power of cell phones and the internet and, and how long things live um, on the internet. I think we tend to not really talk about that with kids until middle school or high school. Um, I would also support, and I'm sure we'll get into this later, um, much more intensive mental health um, options and opportunities at the schools. I think that that will go a long way to reduce the not only the cyberbullying but bullying in general. Um, I, I think that there does need to be a, a, another look at disciplinary policies and procedures. Um, as a teacher, I deal with those all of the time. And I hear students say, well, I used it all through high school. I was told to use it in class. And I think that just opens up opportunities that perhaps we shouldn't. Um, so I do think that to a large extent social media has been the problem. Now how to combat that? I'm with Mr. Farrell. I wish I had an answer for that. I think earlier education would be one thing and just increased mental health um, options and opportunities in schools would be another. Thank you. Nicholas Hadley. Well, you know, as a seated board member, one of the biggest things that I hear complaints from either by a phone call or 
social media or for face to face is the topic of bullying. Bullying has been an issue since Bible times of David and Goliath. It's something that is not going to go away. It's not something that can be changed overnight and it's not something that's ever going to go away. And I truly believe that it's going to come down to, like the folks here have said, we need to educate our students that social media is a way to stand by or stand behind the computer screen and say, you know, anything that you want. But you have to realize there's sometimes consequences when it comes to that. So we need to make sure that there are folks that whenever kids feel that they are being bullied, that there are not just guidance counselors, but there's also school psychologists or more folks on hand that can actually take care of the problem of this bullying. Cyberbullying, I don't know how you control that. That's going to take an inter, a, uh, interaction from the parents, grandparents, or anyone else that's out there. And, you know, we've got to have some parents step up, too. You know, a lot of times in today's society, kids go to school, they come home from school, parents don't have a clue what's going on. So we need to get the parents, grandparents, and everybody involved, and we need to make sure that they understand the concept of bullying, and we need to make sure that uh, they uh, are educated, basically. So that's good to go. Carmen Jackson. Yes, uh, bullying is a major uh, issue today, and I think we need to change our curriculum. Our curriculum has to include more education about bullying. Uh, just the idea of identifying bullying, uh, there's bullying in the home. Maybe some parents are bullying their kids instead of raising their kids, yelling and screaming and calling around their names, some people, not all. Um, just every faction of the family, we need to start from the ground up. We need to look at what kind of bullying is going on in the family, uh, in the schools, and uh, with each other. We need to talk more about civility and how we need to address each other uh, in all factions of life. Uh, ideally, um, I would like cyberbullying to go away, but that's not going to happen. So we need to talk about changing our students' behaviors and, uh, and our family behavior, and we can do that by being inclusive. We have to include the parents in this discussion, the teachers and administrators. We all have to get together and come up with some new values that we want to implement in our school, in our schools, and across the board. But there is no one answer. We all have to get together to come up with a new uh, reality. And uh, in order to address the cell phone, I know that's a big problem. Again, we need to include everyone in those discussions instead of administering um, policies from top down and making demands on our students, you can't do this, you better not do that. We need to be more inclusive in our discussions and outcomes. Thank you. Morgan Mayer. I agree. I think that the attitude toward bullying in the school system needs to be treated as an inclusive problem. So making sure that parents understand that they need to have standards set aside for children at home, just like teachers have standards for children in the schools. Um, you need to make sure that the school administrators are on the same page, um, the counselors are on the same page. But moreover, just as much as it is important to address disciplining bullies, I think it's so important to address helping those who are being bullied. Um, I think that one of the biggest things we can do to help those students is to increase mental health awareness and education in the school system. Um, understand that it is something that is happening on a daily basis and it can very much impact children's lives, especially when they're at a young age like that. Um, so I want to make sure that it's being talked about and it's not something that's being tiptoed around um, and we have resources for those students. Thank you. Jim Robertson. When it comes to bullying, I try to think back 40-some years ago in grade school and what was bullying, what's different then than what is now? Was it the parents' upbringing? Was it you're going to get a SWAT, a, a SWAT if you come home for doing something you weren't supposed to do? Were you going to pay a, a, a fine? Were you going to lose your allowance? What were you going to lose for this type of uh, a, a character going on? As time progresses with technology and stuff and the cell phones came in, it was an opportune time for students to be able to say things, not eye to eye or not, but they could text it, they could talk about it or whatever, and never actually see the person or whatever they were talking about. I know that the government and state and local uh, offices and officials are trying to find something that would cause this to cease, 
But everything that we do, it's like we try to build a bridge to get around it for the part time. We're not fixing the problem. Now, how harsh do we get? You know, how much of a stickler are we going to be in regards to parent upbringing? I, I would think that a lot of teachers in the county are parents as well as teachers or, or, or instructors in those things. So my idea is to sit down and come up with a new set of rules. Maybe they're there, they just need tweaked, where the, maybe the parents are going to become responsible for what's going on and that the students are going to become a little more responsible. Because I don't think at this day and age, as long as we allow the younger generation to carry on without having respect for the, younger, or for the older generation, I think we're going backwards. Thank you, sir. Thank you. David Bond, you're next. So I have to, first of all, disagree with a couple of the comments. Uh, the first one would be, how are you going to get the parents involved? That's, that's issue number one. Parents aren't involved anymore to, the, to a large degree as they should be. Not all parents, some parents. But this isn't something we just sit here and talk about. We're talking about something that can cause suicide. It can cause a kid to kill himself or herself for stupidity from another, from another student. So here's my thoughts on it. We have a, an alternative school that, as best I can be told, has about 13 students in it. So it's sitting there and it's not been talked about for closure, but it's certainly underutilized. My view is this. Let's bring social workers, whatever it takes, maybe three, four, I don't know how many it would take, but a few. Mental health professionals, let's bring them on board to the, to the school system. Let's let teachers then refer students who have multiple like three strikes you're out kind of thing. Third time you're referred for an issue, you get sent to be evaluated. If that mental health professional says, this child has deeper issues than whatever it is, remove the child from that school, take them out of the picture and put them in the alternative school. Give them counseling, find out if it's a home situation, address the situation that's causing the problem. When that child is then deemed able, send them back into the regular classroom. Leaving them in the classroom, the cell phone's not going to matter. When you talk about taking cell, take the child away from the other kids he's bullying, the cell phone becomes not important. They're not the target anymore. But put them away in, into a place where they can still be taught, they can still get the education they need, and they can get the counseling that they may need. And it may be as a family situation that needs to be addressed. Let that happen so that the bullying is out of the picture. Until we address it for what it is, um, it's it's not going to go away you can you cannot make the behavior go away but you can take the problem out of the out of the mix so to speak so anyway that's how i see it i think there needs to be more than just talk there needs to be action Rayel davis when i think of bullying in the schools and cyberbullying, i think of our counselors in the school system itself directly being underutilized and undervalued um, we tend to think of school counselors as the people who help you figure out where to go to college and they're there for maybe some kind of emergency on hand. But when I went through my master's program to get my degree in marriage and family therapy, I had a lot of classes that overlap with school counselors. They, a lot of them do have a mental health background. And I think that whenever you're addressing, they, counselors would be an excellent source of wealth of information for helping the education piece of bullying. What is bullying? Someone's allowed to not be your friend. That's not the same thing as bullying. And and when it comes to the the phones, specifically that brings up issues when it happens off school grounds, whose responsibility is it to deal with that? But it is coming into the schools. And I taught Psychology 101 this past semester, which was seniors in high school as part of the early college program through AC. And those kids would tell me that how they had all the reasons to back up the increased rates of depression and anxiety in teenagers, and they attribute it to their phones, and they don't stop. And what that sounds like to me is an addiction. is It's something that's causing you harm, but you just can't stop doing it. And to take that educational piece in a developmentally appropriate way, because even as an adult, I don't know about you, I never took a class on how to use social media and Facebook etiquette. We don't, we don't have that yet. And getting it at the school level that could help, we're not going to eliminate bullying and cyberbullying, but we could reduce it. Thank you. We're going to take a time out, take a break here, and be back with more of our coverage of the WCBC Allegheny County Board of Education Candidate Forum after these messages. Uh, 
This way. A real quick point, keep your microphone as close to your mouth as possible. You pick up better? What? Yeah, give it two inches, but... <laughs> we don't have the microphone like they had on Wide World of Sports. <laughs> Where you can hold it down here. Welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to the WCBC Allegheny County Board of Education Candidate Forum. To answer our question next will be Deb Frank. To ask it, local attorney George Mac McKinley. Thank you. Um, Ms. Frank, with two exceptions, very few of you on this panel tonight are embracing the idea of redistricting or consolidation. So I'm going to ask you one, two questions, a two-part question. Why did we spend the money for a study? And what are we going to do to make up the difference? To how are we going to fund this operation? I'm not, I'm not currently on the board, so I don't know why they made the decision to hire an outside firm. It makes sense to me to hire somebody outside because they don't have a dog in the race. You know, to them, I mean, they're just looking at all the, the uh, facts and figures. So I, I can't answer that part. Um, what was the second part of your question? Well, if we're not going to consolidate mm -hmm. or we're not going to embrace redistricting, which I don't hear a great fanfare for, how are we going to fund the operation of education in Allegheny County? That's a really good question because, and I will echo what Snake said, um, when you look at some classrooms with seven students and others over the average of 15 or 16, far above that number, 
we've got to think well, what kind of quality of education is happening in both of those classrooms. Uh, the, the the classes with seven students in aren't given given the opportunities that the larger classes have. Uh, so I would be concerned about that, and that's what I believe Snake was referencing um, in terms of of opportunities. Uh, so I don't know. I'm still going with an open mind. As I mentioned when I went there, they had a lot of facts and figures. Um, there were numbers that surprised me about utilization of buildings. So that was a bit alarming that half of some of these schools are not being used at all. Um, so I do worry about the infrastructure and, and trying to pay the utilities for buildings that we're not using and that money could be shifted to programs and opportunities for students. So that's that's why I'm I guess remaining more open to the to the idea of redistricting, um, but again, we've had just one public session. There are dozens, I'm sure, planned. Um, so I will hear um, what everybody else is looking at. But the the difference in class sizes is, I think, the the point that made me think, yeah, this this might make sense that we give some thought to this. Nicholas Hadley. Well, as I said earlier, I think the redistricting was actually a good idea uh, because there are so many students that go to different schools that live on the same street. So I think it comes down to this elementary school may have a little bit more. Uh, so I think that we have to shift classes as opposed to actually closing schools. And I think to me that's when I hear redistricting, I think of shifting some kids from South Penn to go over here to John Humbert or uh, go from Bell to Frost or something of that nature. And I'm, I'm just throwing out names so I'm not picking anybody out. But I think that to me is redistricting because then that levels the playing field of students to teacher and that makes better choices, uh, in my opinion. Now, I was not on the board whenever they decided to do this, but I think that's the idea, is to consolidate classroom sizes, not necessarily schools. Now, the way that we pay for that is the same way that we've done for years. We beg, borrow, and we don't steal, but we have to beg for everything that we get. And unfortunately, those studies that we saw the other night at the forum, said that it would take about $800,000 to remodel and renovate Westmar Middle School just to incorporate George's Creek. Well, I think that it was probably about a third of that to keep George's Creek open. So it's going to take several years down the road before you would ever recoup any of that money um, to just take and close a school to put them into another school. Once again, like I said, that was basically saying, hey, we got a little extra room. Let's go ahead and put this school in there just because it makes sense. Um, because that's going to end up being just the worst thing possible, in my opinion. So um, to pay for it, we just have to continue believing that we're going to have more than maintenance of effort, okay, because that's what we've been funded at by the county commissioners, except for this year. They gave us about $60,000 more, and thank them for that. But we just got to keep going the way we're going. Carmen Jackson. Yes, thank you. I want to get this right. Um, I'm concerned about making any decision in isolation, uh, particularly the school system. Again, I want to reiterate that we need to work with the community and use the buildings for more functional reasons. And there are good ideas for how we can do use funding, raise funding with the building in terms of having activities and different programs within the schools. Our students do not have enough to do. Um, and in order to increase um, student activity and productivity, we need to give them other plans of activities within the school systems. So I think the community, the local community and administrators need to work with the schools and see the economical impact of closing the schools. Uh, as far as redistricting, we got a lot more to learn um, about how that could work, but I think that's feasible to look at. Um, as far as the study that was done, I, I went to the meeting, but a lot of facts were not given. A lot of topics was talked about, but a lot of the numbers that I would like to see, I would like to see a copy of the full study as to how these decisions would be made based on the study. So the study was important, but it's important also to share all the information, not pick and choose categories. And uh, I even went on the internet and again, there was just categories of what they looked at, not so much of facts. So it's a lot more information I'd like to see out of that study. Um, as far as funding, I'm sure there's programs that can be rearranged. 
But again, I cannot stress enough, we got to build the entire community because if we close the community and close our schools, we're also shutting the doors to students to get along with each other and do things other than hang out. And we've got to address the hanging out. Thank you. Morgan Mayer. So echoing what a lot of the other candidates have said, the entire report has not been released yet. Um, there's a lot of information that people want to know that's not out there. I think that it's unfortunate that um, this decision was sort of put out there publicly um, and now we don't have all the answers to the questions. Um, and it is it is a big deal and it's, it's rightfully so that people are concerned. Um, but the facts are still not all made public yet. Um, the other thing is that I think redistricting is still a really good idea. I think that it is a problem that classroom sizes vary so drastically across the county and there are definitely things that we can do to address that. Um, and once again, redistrict, redistricting schools and closing schools are not the same thing. Um, in terms of the budget, I think that this is a really good example of why it's so important to review the budget regularly and see what is working and what is not because the same things that are working one year are not necessarily going to be working as well the next year. So it's really important to make sure that we're spending money on what is the best benefit for the students. Um, I also think that we should be open to alternative funding sources, whether it be grants, federal or state, whatever the case may be, um, as well as this is a prime example of why it's so important to work with the county commissioners and make sure that we have a good working relationship to ensure that they are still supportive of, of the board and funding us as best as they can. Thank you. I may, if I may interrupt you. Sure. My question was probably not very specific or I wasn't clear. But what I was saying is since you aren't embracing the idea, most of this panel is not embracing sure. the idea of redistricting or consolidation, then tell me how you're going to fund the operation. Where do you think this money's coming from? I know there's always Dr. Cox's complaint that maintenance of effort doesn't get it, but this is pretty high funding for what we're getting education-wise here. So how do we make this thing work if we're not going to do those things? Would you like me to respond again? Yeah, go ahead, and then if someone wants to kick in that has already answered, we'll let you do that. Okay. Um, so, like I said, I think that I don't think it's a bad idea to start looking at alternative funding sources. I don't think it's a bad idea to make sure that um, we are fully utilizing what is available to us. Um, and I also want to echo that I do believe that budget reviews are going to be really crucial, especially in the coming years, making sure that every dollar that we're spending has the highest outcome possible. If we're spending money and the benefit is not large enough to whatever standard we want to hold it to, then that's something that really needs to be revisited. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Carmen, Nick, Deb, you want to add anything right now or do you want to wait until the end? Okay. You're good. Okay. Jim Robertson, you're next. I believe I stated before that when you have a survey done or, and this is the results that come back, when I said it that um, and watched the committee that was selected to do that, we had uh, teachers, uh, I think we had principals, and I think we had a representative from an elected official that sat on that committee. Now as a, a, a taxpayer here, I'm going to say that I trust what these people believe in. I trust that's why they were selected to give an honest effort to do that. Now. If it's this money's needed, what are we going to cut? Well, you know, in, over the years since I've been available with the Board of Education to do some projects with them, I found that a lot of STEM grants coming in are utilized over a period of a, a two or three years, and then they're done because they're not coming back. So now we have in limbo. We have a program that was set up, and now we don't have the money to fund it. You tell me what you want to cut. You want to cut lunches? You want to cut the after-school programs? Do you want to tell businesses not to give money and, and go out there and do the focus on the futures and those type of things? Do the uh, uh, interviews at the Career Center free of charge, in-kind credits that I call it? That's money. In-kind credits is money. And that's money that this community is giving right now to help this educational system out in Allegheny County. And I'm proud to be part of that. And it's been a part of that to show that we care. We, I can't go and open up a box and say, here's a million dollars, do with it what you want. If they need a roof tomorrow because it's uh, flooded out and it's leaking, I don't know where they're gonna get it. 
So I, I can't give you a dream facility that this is the way it is. It's not. This is reality we're talking about. And I think if I'm elected, I'm going to sit there and make some hard decisions that are going to be uncomfortable with some people. But if you elect me, that's what it's all about, to make some uncomfortable decisions that are good for the kids. Thank you. We go to the other end of the table and David Bond. David? Can I respond? Oh, okay, hold on. Carmen? Yes, uh, there's funding that we don't know where, it had, where it's gone to or what it's used for. But for example, there was funding from, from Rocky Gap that was supposed to go to the school system. Um, it has not been um, made available, at least to me, I don't know how many others. If that money was given to the school system, it did not show up in the schools. Where did it go? I understand it went to balanced budgets. So there's some, some things going on that we don't have the facts for yet. So I don't want to criticize, but I just know that there's more information that we have yet to receive. Okay. Now, David. Thank you. So let me start by saying I'm not against redistricting. If we have to even the field out between the schools, that's, but closing I'm against. So, now, with that said, I think I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think I'm the only one on this panel that's actually had to balance my own budget for the last 30 years. So there hasn't been any grants for me and there hasn't been any free money or looking here or there. And I can tell you one thing I do know about grants is just like Snake said, they go away. So if we start a new program based on grants, we're gonna be in trouble whenever that grant expires. So where do we find the money? Well, here's, here's my thoughts. First of all, if we have all this extra space, there's a very nice piece of property sitting on Washington Street that we could move those administrators into another building. We don't need that building. There's no parking there when you go there as a parent to try to get a place to park. You have to pay. Wouldn't it be better if it was in one of the schools we already have? Second, we need to trim some staff at the top. As somebody that makes my own payroll, I look at the state of Maryland paying a governor 165000 and we're paying our superintendent over two hundred. dollars Something's wrong with that picture. We could probably do it for a lot less money, and we probably don't need as many people under him as are occupying those spaces. Next place to save money, uh, I'd love to see um, uh, a, a, a resource officer in every school. But it seems like every time something comes up, it's more expensive than reality. And I hate to steal this away from Bob because he's probably going to want to say it. But they're asking for 13, res there's 13 schools, 13 resource officers. They asked for one point, I think it was $3 million. I just spoke with a deputy that said they would work for $30,000 as a retired deputy. We know they're not going to shoot anybody. We know they've, they've got a great career. They don't need benefits. Put them in part time. Those people would work for 30,000 times 13, that's 390. What's the difference? Where's the other 1 million? What do we need it for? We need to cut. You put me in office, I'm gonna find the places that we're wasting money and we're gonna put it back in education. Thanks. Rayel Davis. I just wanted to clarify that I was against the idea of closing two elementary schools as a first step measure. And I did not mention that I'm not against redistricting, as many other people have said. Um, part of the study included looking at rebalancing Frost and Bell. That does not have the same headline grab as the study was done and we want to close Parkside and George's Creek. The, and that is, like they said, it's very different. As far as the funding goes, I agree that there probably is wasteful spending going on that needs looked at. I'm not on the board. I don't know why the purpose of the study being conducted. I'm, I'm not sure why that was done. But my background includes ha kind of being a creative problem solver. And that includes what, and making, and having people come together. I, for example, I didn't have money to have a big fancy wedding. But there was somebody who came and took the pictures, and somebody who came and did the cake, and somebody who came and did the flowers. So I wonder if there isn't some way our community could come together as well. I know there's liability and background issues and things like that, but I'm a mental health professional. No one's asked me to volunteer my time in the schools to help with bullying or things like that. But maybe we could implement some kind of creative programs like that where parents and, uh, and family concerned citizens would be willing to volunteer their time that could help out with things that would help build the schools up that wouldn't cost an exorbitant amount of money. I don't know, it's just an idea. Robert Farrell. You know, it's always easier to spend the money if it's not yours, if it's not coming out of your pocket. And to me, it's frivolous. $20,000 to me is a lot of money to take and spend it 
for some consultant from Arlington or Alexandria or wherever they came from to come up here and look into our community and look at the stats that we already had that they got from our people in the school system. We have very intelligent, very good people working in our school system. And I think we should have gone there first and asked them to, re to put together some semblance of what they wanted to do. We're talking about how many kids are in the schools. We're talking about the maintenance of the schools. Uh, all that information, the transportation, uh, all came from the people that work for the Allegheny County public school system. So we paid this, these folks 20000 to come up and do that. Where are we going to find the money? We really need to look at the budget in the Allegheny County school system to say, you know, is it zero-based budgeting or is it line item veto bud uh, type budgeting? Uh, do we look at what we have to have versus what's nice to have? Do, there are things that I, I can say, just like I said the other day, travel, that people are traveling to Baltimore, people are traveling all over the country to go to conferences and different things from the school system that maybe that really needs to be looked at as a way to cut costs. You know, it's, it, it's something that we, it, it's nice to have, but we really do need school security. And David said it correctly and, you know, took the words right out of my mouth, so he said, but, you know, I, I do think we need to look at these things. We already have that in place, and it's something that, that we need to go with. But I really think looking at the budget as a line item type thing, we could cut some costs. Wayne Foote. You put me on the end of the totem pole after all this has been covered, and I've been up here being an art teacher drawing a big dollar sign. Again, people, it's all about the dollar. Next, there has to be more of a cooperative effort with the county commissioners and the school board to make this thing work. It's called money. It's tax-paying money. I think Snake pointed out that the two pages in the newspaper of people who haven't paid their taxes. All that is what makes this whole machine run. There has to be more transparency with, with monies. Since being on the school board, I have asked the superintendent numerous times to give me some kind of documentation of where does the money go from Rocky Gap. Well, Wayne, we don't have any control over that. You'll have to talk to the commissioners. Well, then I talk to the commissioners and they say, well, the school board has control over it. We have to find out where that money's going. That is a good revenue of money coming in. I own a house here in Allegheny County. I would love to own a beach house down in Charleston, South Carolina. My pocketbook can only afford the one house. So that's a good picture to paint for you. A picture is worth a thousand words with what I just described, me owning a house, wanting a house. You want to have these things, but your pocketbook doesn't do it. I think someone, a couple of these people brought up about, in order for us to live, we have to make sure we balance our checkbooks so that you know, we can pay our bills. Uh, and I would say, going on for the, the next school board, if I would get elected, what is it going to do to make it work? It's going to have to be five people that are going to have to be looking at the same reason, and that is to educate our children and to make sure that our teachers are compensated. They need to be better represented that way. Thank you. Okay, we want to go and order Snake Rob. No, you're good? Okay. okay. Uh, Snake Robertson, Jim Snake Robertson. You heard the reference to Snake I wanted to give. Well, that's, how it's, that's how it's on the ballot. Okay, very good. Uh, you have a, a in, retort. Uh, in regards to uh, Dr. Bond, I totally agree with the 30000 between thirty and $35,000 a year for these. But also some of the uh, independent uh, Frostburgeners are also, if I'm not mis if I'm misunderstood, are throwing in their cop cars and everything that they don't have to pay for. So there is a lot of uh, things coming out with that amount of money. To, to the 1.5 million or 1.3 million, I'm, I'm a little concerned about that. I don't think that's the actual thing that they were asking for. Yeah, to, to uh, clarify that, we did receive a call at the radio station from the Board of Education after this became a bit of an issue, and they said they took the number from the Maryland Department of Legislative Reference in oh. order to get their, their numbers from. Now, 
I think everybody's talking about the same thing with different numbers. Okay. You mentioned the uh, police car, cars. We were also told about training expense as right. well as is figured in as well. Nick? I, I, I just... I just wanted to clarify something that uh, the money that's coming in for Meraki Gap is not coming to the school system. Um, that is not controlled by the school system that I'm aware of. Uh, and it's actually something that the county commissioners have allocated for um, scholarships that mostly are going for AC and also Frostburg State. So it is not something that we're sitting on a gold mine at the school board and uh, have that magic money sitting there. So I just wanted to clarify that. And I believe I agree with you that the 1.2, 1.5 five million was the governor's figure we could probably put a uh, officer in the schools for thirty to thirty five thousand dollars per person so thank you Carmen uh, I just wanted to make one correction from uh, Dave Bond's statement uh, I too have balanced budgets for over 30 years at Frostburg State University well, were you writing the checks out of your account no, they were not out of my Black account, but they were out of school account, and I was audited every year to make sure I knew what I was doing. But I just wanted to make it clear that I do have the experience to look at the budget, and that's why I've emphasized that I don't have enough information to make good decisions at this point. The only difference I meant was at the end of the balancing the budget, you still could go buy the, the food you wanted to eat for the week. At, at the end of balancing your budget, you still got a paycheck. If I balance my budget and there's nothing left, my employees got paid and I didn't. That's well, if difference. I didn't balance my budget, I'd be in jail. <laughs> and they okay. it. They it, was just, it, was just a, it wasn't an argument point. It was just a point of... I just want to be clear. I've had, I've had to run a business. I have the experience. This is a good back and forth. This is what we like to have, and, and I appreciate everyone's candor here. Uh, next with a question, um, I think we've gotten through everybody, yeah. Wayne was complaining about being last, so that would be okay, <laughs> very good. Uh, we go next to Brian Gowans, who will be first with the next set of questions. Brian? Thank you. In the past decade, there have been a number of incidents at Mountain Ridge High School involving inappropriate relationships between teachers and students. Uh, is this unique to Mountain Ridge? It is a system-wide concern, and are you satisfied that there's enough current policies in place to add, offer adequate protection for students. Okay, going first this time will be Carmen Jackson. And she has the microphone. Go ahead. So, to summarize your question, we're talking about security for the schools? No, we've had a number of incidents of uh, inappropriate sexual relationships between students and teachers. And just wondering if you're comfortable with the policies that are in place now. Is there enough to provide adequate protection for the kids? to keep this from being an issue? Right. Uh, well, the problem is probably not the, the policies, um, but the problem is, is that we have to get serious about looking at the patterns of behavior, what's acceptable and not acceptable. We have to educate our students to realize when they're being groomed to be uh, inappropriately touched. We have to look at uh, the responses to each incident and how we got there and what we need to do about it. We need to clean house on this topic. Um, we can change policies, but if they're not followed, that won't matter. So we need to do a lot of education, and we need to be intolerant of that situation. Some of the situations are very old that are just now coming to light. So we need to uh, examine, not make, I don't want to make irrational decisions, but we need to examine what has gone on and what else has to come to light and we need to deal with them um, unequivocally. Morgan Mayer. I agree. I don't, I don't think that at this time the issue stands with the policies that are currently in place. I think that um, my biggest concern would be ensuring that the students who um, unfortunately have been the victims of sexual assault in any type of way are receiving the support that they need, um, whether that be mental health resources, rather, whether that may be physical health resources, whatever the case is. Um, I would definitely ensure that the board continues to um, hold in place responsible hiring practices, um, regular evaluations amongst employees, um, and it's, it's the same as, thing as what Carmen said, to make sure that we're educating students on what is inappropriate and what is not so that they know, they know when to tell somebody that they need help. Jim Snake Robertson. I think there's the proper policies are in place. I think that sometimes if these policies were, uh, let's say, put in five years ago, 
And now with the way the generations are, that maybe they need to be tweaked, maybe they need to be adjusted. Uh, I don't think, I think this has been going on for years. It's just more prevalent nowadays with the younger generation and the older generation with this combination of which I, I don't understand. But um, there are steps you have to take legally. Uh, used to be that the moral aspect of it was enough to curtail what was going on. But that's no longer the reason for it now, okay? It's not the moral part about it, it's the physical part. So my suggestion is, is that we continue with the policies. We look at each one individually because not all of them are the same. And we have, if we have to adjust the policies to suit each time something different happens and add to it or subtract from, then that's what we need to do as an elected board to keep this from going further on with worse consequences. Thank you. David Bond. Okay, so there couldn't possibly have been uh, somebody in there. Had, let me start that over. There had to be somebody in that school system, in that school, that knew what was going on. There's no way all those things could have happened and only the student and that one teacher knew about it. I'm not on the board, but what I would think and what my kids kind of fed back to me was that there's more of a fear of reporting. So the policies could be in place, but if there's not an easy way for somebody to report it, then that's a problem. So if you have a fear of retaliation for reporting the issue, nothing's going to happen. As I said, someone had to know, and I think I think we need to not look at is the policy, right? Well, you can write as many policies as you want, but if you don't have people have, that have a way of turning somebody in or, re or reporting it without fear of being acted against, then that's not going to change. But th 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 just that's totally unacceptable that that happened once in our local high school under the administration that was there. For it to have happened multiple times is completely unacceptable. Ray L. Davis. To think of the idea of a teacher taking advantage of a student in that way to me is absolutely egregious and should have, there should just be a zero tolerance policy for that. Um, of course, after a proper investigation, but also when I think of the lens of a therapist and the effect of trauma on sexual assault victims, I think that what Dr. Bond just said is right people, they need to have an easy way to report what's going on and feel safe in doing so because they're off this they're the grooming aspect kids may not realize that that's what's going on they may not feel that they are a victim there might even be a romantic sized quality to it um, with the develop with where they are developmentally in high school and there is that if they know when they know what's happening there is that fear so there needs to be an easy way that other professionals that know that it's going on without fear of retribution of their jobs and their reputations would be at stake as well as the kids that to for how to I guess I guess it gets back to that idea of having counselors providing that developmentally appropriate education whether it's cyberbullying or healthy relationships and sexual assault and what what that what that means Robert Farrell I think I'm probably the only person sitting up here in front of this room that's done those type of investigations the law is pretty clear Title IX says that it will not, you will not do that. Uh, when the first incident occurred at Mountain Ridge, I think that should have set off some bells and whistles for the administration up there. When the second incident occurred, it definitely should have set off all kinds of bells and whistles. And for the third incident, I just can't even imagine. I can't even fathom it. I can't imagine that folks sat at Washington Street or at Mountain Ridge administration or whoever and did not do something even after the first one there should have been a top to bottom review and I think title nine calls for that I know that the, the specifically the one I investigated years ago at Mountain Ridge uh, we did we went three days day and night myself and a C3I officer and we re presented a report to the superintendent which went to the board after that as to what exactly occurred and how it occurred and who was involved and uh, we talked to kids we talked to parents we talked to administrators we talked to teachers and that all needed to occur I can't see how we got through uh, two or for goodness sakes three without something uh, 
showing up on the radar. And part of this, I think, is due to the, the, the policy, and I hate to say bring policy into this because I don't think policy is going to do any good, but the policy where board members are not allowed to talk to uh, the teachers or the administrators, and they are not allowed to talk to board members without the superintendent's approval. And any time you cut down on communication, you're going to miss something. And I think that's exactly what happened. And I think the, the community of Frostburg and Mountain Ridge High School suffered for it. Wayne Foote. Here's a teacher again speaking. I taught in four schools and I was in four faculty rooms. You could go into any faculty room and you could find out what's going on in the school, what's going on in the community, who's playing in the World Series, and it goes on down the line. I think we are going in a new direction. It was kind of late up at Mountain Ridge. We have an interim principal up there now, Danny Carter. I taught with him at Fort Hill. He is a disciplinarian. He was up there when we used to have a principal by the name of Bob Scarcelli, who they called Custodian Bob. Why? He was out in the halls, disguised, picking up trash in the hallways. But his eyes were seeing what was going on. He knew what was going on in his school. So with Danny up there, um, I know he's going to be out walking the halls. He is a personal friend. He says, Wayne, I will be out there. I will be seeing what goes on in my school. So I think that's very important. Uh, and he also graduated from Bell. He played against some of my soccer teams when I coached up at Valley. So he knows the community. And I would hope, sincerely, that we can vote him. Well, we don't get a chance to say anything to the school board. It's a superintendent that, that makes the appointment for the principal. I think there's eight people that are going to be interviewed. I would love to see Danny get that position. So it all goes down to teamwork. You've got teachers working together, telling uh, the principal this is going on, that's going on, and not this zip mouth where you can't talk to this person, you can't talk to that person. That burns me up. Part of my whole life of teaching was you communicate. If you don't communicate, you get nowhere. Thank you. Deborah Frank. I share the concerns that everybody else has expressed about those incidents happening at Mountain Ridge. Um, embedded in the question, I think, is an implication about is it systemic, is it a culture that was happening at, at Mountain Ridge, and I don't know that that's true. I, I hate the fact that those incidents happened at that school separated by some time. Um, in terms of the policy, I think the policy is, is a good one. Um, I have to disagree with you on one of the points that, that you were making, David Bond, and that is that there's, there's anonymity that goes with reporting. Now, whether people perceive that there's something happening to them as they report, I, I can't buy that. I'm sorry, I've taught at this school. We've, we've worked Title IX for forever. Um, we've had so much training. There's so much anonym, and I can't even say it now. I'll say being anonymous. Yeah, I'll go that way. Um, with reporting. So I don't know where the failure was at Mountain Ridge. I can't believe for a second, though, and I refuse to say that, that our teachers feel that intimidated that they would let something happen like that for months and months on end. I'm sorry, I disagree with that. So I think with a new principal, I think with further or improved Title IX training, I hope we never see this again, but do I think it's systemic? Do I think it's a culture that happens in Frostburg? No, I don't. I absolutely do not. These incidents, I believe, were all separate. Um, and, and it's tragic because it implies that everything in Mountain Ridge was, was hidden and, and covered up, and I don't agree with that for a moment. Nick Hadley. Uh, it's unfortunate as to what happened at Mountain Ridge, and, uh, you know, and many folks here have said that uh, the perceived issue is now gone. We have Danny Carter in there as the interim principal. Things are, you know, hopefully looking up and everything's going to be fine there. I sat on the board whenever that went down and there were many, many interviews. There was, you know, they dug into that case tremendously. And unfortunately, if people knew and they didn't tell, shame on them. There is such a thing as mandatory reporting, and we need to make sure that all of our teachers and all of our staff and everyone is aware that there are consequences if you do not 
report something that you see. You know, and I think that's where it comes in. If there are teachers that are seeing something that's happening, then they need to be called on the carpet for it. Uh, it does, you know, be it is the principal's problem because they're at the top. But ultimately, the principal may not know everything that's going on in the school, um, even if he's out and about or she's out and about throughout the school. Uh, a lot of these things were happening outside of the classroom. They weren't happening at Mountain Ridge. Um, I don't know what happens to my fellow employees when they're, you know, out and about. But um, we need to make sure that it can, that it stops. The policies and procedures have been put in place to be more strict. I have sat on the board for that time frame, my first time around, and we have definitely made sure that it's not going to be tolerated, that we take it very seriously, and that we aren't going to put up with it anymore. So I think it just comes down to education of our teachers, staff, and everyone. Thank you. All right, uh, David wants to respond to his... Uh, Oh, we got all the microphones at this end. <laughs> Move it up. David I don't want to say much about what Deb said, but the, this is the thing. There wouldn't be victims if everybody turned other, everybody else in or reported. Victims happen, and people end up reporting. You know, there's, there are people in, in late adult life that suffer from child abuse that happened when they, they, it finally comes to the surface and causes a problem. So, I mean, I just believe... I'm not saying anything against the integrity of our teachers, but I just believe that in a school that size with that many students and the way kids talk, having raised teenagers, there's no way that teenager didn't say something to either a parent or a teacher or to another student that got to a parent or a teacher. There's no way it, it wasn't known to some degree. That's just my view. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much. And we continue with our next question. And that... Oh. Carmen, I thought you were the first to answer that question. Oh, you have a comment. Okay. okay. Um, I just want to ex expound on the fact that I do have experience with dealing with sexual harassment. Uh, I have not been an investigator in itself, but as the director of residence life at Frostburg State University, mm -hmm. I set up the judicial board system, and we had her sexual harassment cases that came through, and I set up these systems for them to be addressed, and I think they were effectively addressed. I think we need to do a governance system. I think this is an important enough topic to have a governance panel set up that as soon as we hear a problem, it goes to that panel, and action, people see action right away, not drawn out for months and months after a hearing and uh, teachers left in the classroom. I think it needs to be to have an immediate effect and people need to see that. Thank you. All right, very good. We got everybody clear? We're good. <laughs> All right, we will move to our next question. It comes from Kathy Getty from First United Bank. Kathy? At least one current member of the school board has described teacher morale being at an all-time low. Do you believe this is the case? And are there remedies other than salary hikes? And to start with this answer will be Jim Snake Robertson. In regards to addressing that situation, I believe that all the teachers in our county are working under a collective bargaining agreement. And in that collective bargaining agreement, I feel that it states that if you have a problem or you are disgruntled or there's something that's not right and according to your agreement that you put in writing what the problem is, you sign it and you give it to your representative to be presented to the school board in regards to what the problem is. Now that's under a collective bargaining agreement, at least the ones that I'm uh, familiar with at this time. Uh, to take a phone call or to somebody to meet with me privately is not enough evidence for me. I, it must be in writing and it must be signed. I've had different things in my past before I retired in regards to people claiming this, people claiming that, are willing to talk about it, willing to say it, but aren't willing to put it on paper and sign their name to it. So as far as I'm concerned with the disgruntledy, if that's the case, they need to put it down. It needs to be addressed. It needs to be addressed in writing. And I don't know if this time is I will not go by hearsay, a phone call, or a text message. If it's not in writing and not signed, I will not address it. All right, we go to the other end of the table. And David Bond. David? Okay, I'm going to give an example. <clears throat> I, I think teachers are 
a little concerned. I mean, I, I have quite a few, I'll be looking for them coming in my office, but I have quite a few teachers who are patients and they tell me that they're, they're not happy. And I'll give you an example of how they feel from the meeting that was public. We went to that redistricting meeting the other night at uh, the, the Career Center, and one of the teachers that went up and spoke actually publicly said, I hope this, there's no retribution for my, my comments, for my statements, because I want to speak my mind. So if they're working in a situation where they have hesitancy to speak their mind, they have to ask, are you, are you sure not going to you know, come down on me for stating my opinions on this, then that tells me, yeah, there's a concern. But I know personally there's a concern because I hear it from the, the teachers that, that I see in my office. So uh, what are the concerns? That they're concerned uh, their morale may be low because they feel like they can't teach what they want to teach, that they're overburdened with uh, like a governance from the administration of their the thumbs on them all the time. Here's what you must do. Here's what you can't do. And I think we need to open it up and let our teachers do what, they, what they're professionals at doing, and that's teaching. We have great teachers in this county. Uh, a matter of fact, through all my education, my the best teacher I ever had was my high school biology teacher, Bill Richmond. If you're listening, hey, good job. <laughs> he, he put a love in, in 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 me about about the sciences. So, of all the education I had, he was the best. So we have great teachers, and he was from right here in this in this county. We still have great teachers, but we're not letting them teach. <clears throat> so, uh, I think that's what needs to happen. Thank you, yes, Ray L. Davis. I fully support whatever measures that would need to take place that we could look at increasing the idea of teacher autonomy. I have, between headlines and friends of mine that are teachers and people that I, that I know, I completely empathize with the idea of the, the teachers in our county, they're professionals. They have master's level education, doctorate level educations, and they're they feel like glorified babysitters. Like there's so many decision makers in what it is they're what to teach and how to do it and they're meeting, trying to meet the increasing demands of the students and the individual having an individualization to education at the same time so i can definitely empathize with that um i as far as a way to increase teacher morale without it being necessarily a matter of salary i do think there's a lot of little things that can go a long way that don't necessarily cost money um, an example that was brought up to me um, a teacher had told me that something that was taken away within her tenure of teaching was teachers being allowed to have like a dress down on day on Fridays. And um, she's like, a lot of times people would pitch in five bucks, it'd be a fundraiser for March of Dimes. Like, she's like, and she goes, it sounds small, but it was just nice to just throw on jeans and a t-shirt and you know, feel a little bit more relaxed on Fridays. So I think things like that, getting meeting with the teachers and seeing what would make maybe a difference for them, something like that doesn't cost any money and it might make pe people feel heard and more respected at the same time. Okay. Bob Farrell? I agree with, uh one thing that Rael said, and they do it in West Virginia schools, uh, and we did do it here for years, where on Friday the teachers were allowed to have a dress down day, and, and I think it does, there's a little bit of perks do help teachers feel a little bit better about their job. But back to it, they did a survey, I know when my wife was alive and on the board, she wanted it to be an anonymous survey, where it was done by paper and pencil, uh, by the teachers, and collected by a board member, and so it was completely autonomous as to who it was or whatever. I think they ended up doing one by computer. A lot of teachers told me that they really didn't want to participate because it could be tracked back to them, be tra tracked back to the computer. But either way, they went ahead and did it, and I think the results were that there was a morale problem. I don't know the exact numbers. Um, I do know what I've, I'm like David, I've heard from teachers, they're not happy. Uh, I don't think it's a money issue. I really don't believe that the teachers in this county want more money. I think they're unhappy with some of the insurance they have. I think they are unhappy with some of the things that are going on. And I think the morale is just down. And I and if there was a way that I could fix it for them, I would. Um, I think a lot of things that have changed. I can remember when uh, I was teaching at the Career Center, you go into the... To the uh, faculty room and Moose Arnone would be sitting in there and he'd say, I'll buy you a cup of coffee and you'd sit down and talk for a while. And and I think those things went a long way to where teachers thought board members were vested in what they were doing. And I think that would definitely make a severe a difference in how teachers felt about what was going on. Wayne Foote. Thank you. Me. Going again back being a teacher and then retiring 
and going out to sub. Those four years that I sub before I went on to the school board, the morale issue was bad. Worse than I had seen from 69 when I came into the county up until the new millennium. I, along with Laura Lee, uh, pushed and pushed to get some kind of a survey done. We wanted it done where fill out a ballot, put it in a box, school board member come around and pick it up. No, it was done electronically, and we know how things can be traced. The one good thing about that survey that we pushed for, 74% of the staff consisting of teachers, custodians, everyone, 74% had returns. One of the biggest components was morale. I have been bitching about this since I've been on the school board. I have been the self-appointed flea scratching at the school board. We need to do something to help our teachers with morale. I just had a art teacher call me a week ago. And when I was out being a supervisor uh, for art, which I was in the county for a while, he was a great teacher. I know he's a good teacher. His comment to me was, Wayne, it's not fun to teach anymore. Now, to have a teacher say that, there's something a matter with the equation. The end product that's coming out is not going to be good. Wayne, you know, I get tired of this sending kids to the office on a discipline problem. and They come right back. And it's the same thing over and over. There has to be some backup. There has to be some support. We have to get back to the issues of respect. And this is all created by parents. In many cases in our county, me, for example, grandparents. Grandparents stepping up to the plate and trying to get the kids to do what they need to do. Thank you. Get me talking. I can't shut up. That's a teacher. Don't. Just treat, treat it like it's a, a bell at the end of class, okay? <laughs> Deborah Frank, you're next. Um, I, in my role as a teacher here for 30-some years, I spent a lot of time predominantly with secondary school teachers, um, with internships and, and student exchanges and, and that sort of thing. Um, what I hear more of than anything is a little bit what Wayne was saying, and that is not necessarily a morale issue, but a respect issue, and, and most often from students. So it's not a, a feeling of lack of respect from the administration or, or anything like that. It comes from the respect in the classroom uh, demonstrated by a student. What I hear more from teachers is not about pay. You know, and I think it does a real disservice to our teaching profession when people say, oh, they just want more money. It really is not that. Um, it's having the ability to showcase their achievements, their accomplishments. Um, I've met with some of them. And, and as a teacher here at this college, we know that nobody knows what you're doing unless you toot your own horn. And I say that to my high school teaching friends. You know, nobody knows what you're doing in the classroom. I know you're doing awesome things, but unless you publicize that and get the word out yourself, um, you know, there won't be that sort of commanding respect that you're looking for. I know that they get frustrated, not with having a, a finger on them from the administration here, but on federal regulations and laws regarding assessment with Common Core and the park testing and and all of the testing that has to be done, that's a frustration and that's beyond the control of our superintendent. Um, but I, I think it goes back to finding, you know, if there's a way to get a blue ribbon committee on the Board of Ed to, to gauge what is most important uh, for teachers. But I think that the quickest way to ruin the morale in an, in an organization is to have a small group of people saying there's a morale problem. And that worries me a lot because there are a lot of energetic, really enthusiastic teachers who I feel are being dragged into a poor morale problem. Nick Hadley. Well, unfortunately, our teachers in the past five to ten years, they've had so many federal and state mandates that have been pushed down to them that the school board, the superintendent, and supervisors at the board really don't have any control over. And unfortunately, they just have to follow through with what's given to them, and they have been pushed down and pushed down. And, you know, I, can, I feel for a lot of the teachers. I hear from friends and family members that are teachers, and I would agree as well. I don't think it's necessarily a, uh, you know, 
money issue. I don't even think it's the, you know, the health issue as far as the insurance itself. I think it's the money that's coming out of their pay for the health insurance that's the problem. Um, so that takes it down. But I think it comes with respect, and I agree with you, Deb, where it's from the students, but I also feel like they don't have any input. We have to be sure that we take into consideration all of our teacher feelings. We need to have a collaboration with our teachers and our principals and our staff. Not where we say we're going to be listening to them, but we really need to sit down as board members or whatever and talk to our teachers. We need to be face to face. We need to make sure that when it comes to their evaluations that they have input. Because who's going to know better than themselves what they need to be evaluated on. You know, a lot of times these park tests are what drive schools because they're afraid that if they don't have good test scores that they're going to look to, or they're going to be portrayed as a bad teacher. That isn't necessarily the case. It's a state mandated test that comes down. That doesn't prove anything. That just proves that some kid doesn't test well. All right? So we need to make sure that these teachers have the respect from top down and from bottom up, from the students up, and that needs to be where the board intervenes and says, what do you need to do your job? Allow us to help you with that. Thank you very much. Carmen Jackson. Yes, thank you. Uh, we have a lot of opportunity here in this community to um, generate uh, working relationships. We have Allegheny College, we have Frostburg State, uh, we have um, Potomac State College, we have a lot of opportunities for internships and working together to uh, assist our students, uh, our teachers in the classrooms. So we need to, uh, you know, increase some of our activity between the campuses. And that gives our students a better opportunity for uh, preparing them to become good teachers. Um, that's one concern. I do think also that money is, uh, a pay raise for the teachers would not hurt. Uh, many of our teachers are buying the supplies for their classrooms that should be supplied. Uh, there are other schools that uh, the, t the, the youth are given uh, tablets to communicate with their teachers with directly to um, come up with uh, their class evaluations or various reasons to contact each other. Uh, I don't see that happening right now in our school system. I was told that they have a card of computers that signed that people can sign up for, for temporary use and so forth. So we're falling behind. If we don't better prepare our students to use this technology properly and to the best effect, then uh, we're doing a disservice because when they graduate, they're not going to be at the level they need to be at to get some of these technological jobs. Um, getting back to the money. Um, our teachers don't feel respected. And, well, I said getting back to the money, then I start talking about respect. Okay, so let's get back to the money. Uh, not only are teachers having to pay for um, classroom materials, our students don't have adequate equipment in, in our classrooms. So when we're talking about um, spending money, thank you. You're better at that than Wayne. <laughs> Morgan Mayer. <laughs> so I agree. I think this is absolutely a respect issue versus a morale issue. Um, my mom was a teacher. My sister is a teacher at George's Creek. I have the utmost respect for teachers. Um, I think they have some of the hardest jobs. Um, I think that this attitude shift that we're talking about needs to start at the top down. I think that if uh, the public hears the elected board members speak about teachers in a respectful way. Um, that's the best way to influence them and to create that trickle-down effect in terms of respect for teachers. Um, I think that everybody here could probably think of at least one teacher in their life who has gone above and beyond for them. And I'm grateful to have had a few in my life. Um, and I, I wholeheartedly think that they should be treated as such. I think they should be given the freedom in their classrooms because they know their students the best. I think they should be allowed freedom in developing their curriculum. Um, I think that professional development is another really great opportunity to show teachers that they're supported um, and recognized because that's a really good way of investing back into teachers because they should be treated as such an important resource. Thank you. 
Thank you very much, uh, David Bond, and then we're going to take a break. David, go ahead. I just wanted to say that um, I mean, Nick had a lot of great points, but he's, if, if unless I'm mistaken, he's been on the board twice already. So if those great ideas were going to be implemented, wouldn't they have, wouldn't they have happened already? Nick, you want a chance? I would. Okay. <laughs> Uh, well, you know, to be completely honest, one of the things that I saw that worked out very well was there was a teacher forum that was held not too long ago, and that actually gave teachers a chance to come in and actually voice their opinion. To my knowledge, there's been nothing that has, you know, been done like that before. I would like to see that happen. Uh, you know, I'm six months into this from being governor appointed, so I'm kind of getting my feet wet again. Um, but it's one of those things where you can work, but I'm one of five. Okay, and just because I have an idea doesn't mean it's going to fly with everyone else. But we need to make sure that we take into consideration all of the teachers and staff. And if that is, you know, they wanted a survey, it turned out where they think that it was, okay, sorry. <coughs> all, all right, very quickly. Okay, very quickly, I'd just like to say some of our teachers are working extra jobs to make ends meet. And we need to do more to fund our teachers so that they can uh, spend more time at the school or with their students and preparing for class. And I'll just stop at that, but I have a lot more to say on that one. Okay, very good. Just, and to, just to add to what, the forms Well, get, get a microphone. I was the one who pushed for bitch sessions. I always liked to bitch as a teacher. No, you can't call them bitch sessions. They have to be called a form. So we got the first forms. And Dr. Cox forgot about it, but one of the board members said, no, you said that you would do that. There were supposed to be two, one in Cumberland and one up at Frostburg. But we got it started. We got one. If get elected, I'm going to have town hall meetings, and we're going to have bitch sessions with the teachers so they can unload and tell us what they want to be done and how we can help them teach better. Thank you. You got the B word in five times. Okay. We're going to take time out. We'll be back with the conclusion of our forum tonight after this on WCBC.
To uh, answer our next question first will be Rayel Davis, and to ask that question will be local attorney George Mac McKinley. Mac? Yes, thank you very much. As uh, someone who represented a teacher who was involved in the first incident that happened at Mountain Ridge, I have some pretty uh, specific information of what was going on, and I do want to tell you, a lot of people knew. That thing was an issue throughout that school. There were students talking, there were people talking to teachers, and there were people talking to their parents. And it didn't go anywhere until it came to a head. That having been said, and believing that the problem stems from the very top, that having been said, you hire one employee as the Board of Education. That's the superintendent of schools. Are you satisfied with the current superintendent of schools, uh, his performance so far? Ray L. Davis, you are number one on the list. All right, I'm just taking a second on that one. That was a lot. <laughs> I think that at somebody who is the superintendent of schools is a leader. I think somebody who is in a leadership position that knows something like that's going on and failed to act on it should be held accountable. So with it being framed that way, um, I would say no. I don't, I don't think that somebody who oversaw something like that, like I, I do think that I, those things do tend to have a systemic nature, not in the idea that it happened, like it was a Frostburg issue, just a sexual assault itself. itself. And somebody who, like, <laughs> Ethically and morally, you should step down, really. It, I mean, that might sound extreme, but you can't let something like that, ha if it, to that degree, like, no, I would not be satisfied with it. Bob Farrell. You know, I, I worked for the system then, George. I had done, as I said earlier, many of investigations as far as inappropriate touching some were founded some were unfounded and I have a zero tolerance for that you're a teacher you do not under any circumstances have contact with children not tolerated um, the second part of that question am I satisfied that the that the with the superintendent no I think that it goes by the same theory as Harry Truman the buck stops here and he should have known, and he should have known, maybe not after the first one, but when the second one hit his desk, uh, certainly should have been something done. I was still working for the system then, and I was forbidden to have anything to do with that investigation, so I had nothing to do with that investigation. Uh, 
I would have done it a whole lot different at that. And I think there is a lot of information there, as you said, that should have been gathered. I had kids and I had parents tell me after that that it was known and it was reported. And that's against Title IX. And whoever knew and did not report can be held accountable by law. Policies have nothing to do with it. And I would feel bad if I were him and had known and had not done anything. And I do think that he uh, bears responsibility in that matter. Wayne Foot. I'm sorry I was late coming in. What is the question? <laughs> <laughs> Essentially, I say that knowing what, having some specific knowledge about what happened in the first incident at Mountain Ridge High School, I knew that there were, as was indicated by several people in the board, that things like this aren't quiet among teachers. They're not, I mean students, and they're not quiet amongst them talking to their parents, and they're not quiet going back to other teachers. And I know that that went, that went full circle before it ever came to a head. And I believe that the problem stemmed from the top and what I knew about that situation. And I believe that since you only hire one person on the Board of Education, that's the superintendent, knowing things that this superintendent has looked at, the things he's done, total performance, take just that, those instances aside, is only a part of it. Are you satisfied with the performance of the current superintendent? Okay. When I first got on the school board, I got, call, I got a call from a minister from Frostburg. Mr. Foote, I want to thank you for the first person stepping up to the plate and calling an issue on this. And he told me these were his words. This has been the talk of my congregation for the last seven years. So it was being talked about in his church. You mean to tell me it's not metropolitan New York, it's Frostburg, that there wasn't more talk going on in the community. It was going on in a church, so it would be going on in other churches also. So, for some reason, I cannot believe how that did not surface sooner. And I've been in the schools, like I said. People know what's going on. If I saw something with any thing going on, I would be the first to go to my principal and say, look, you better look into this. There's something not right. Again, we go back to what I told you, teamwork. Uh, I have approached Dr. Cox a couple times about this morale thing, and he would say to me, Wayne, do you have an answer? And I'm saying, well, no, we have you as the superintendent. You know, we're paying you that kind of money to figure out how to solve those problems. Now, if I would sit down and maybe put my head to it and was making that kind of money, I could find out, you know, what the problem was. How could I get this corrected? Thank you. No buzzer. Wayne. Okay, thank you. Any follow-up? No follow You're good. Okay. okay. Deb Frank. I'm not privy to the court case, the rec recordings from the court, the police investigations. I don't know any of that. It bothers me a great deal that we're saying they've been talking about it in church for seven years, the kids were talking about it for years. Not one police investigation was initiated regardless of Dr. Cox. That part just shocks me. So I don't have that, those episodes by which to gauge a superintendent's performance. All I know about him is, is his tenure with my kids. My kids have gone through the school system. Um, I, I've been very impressed with the education they've received. I've gotten all my questions answered every time I needed to. But I can tell you, removing him from this equation, if what everybody is saying is true, and I'm shocked that it would be, because I'm sorry for seven years talking about something and not one police investigation is done, then there's something much more um, involved than a superintendent's knowledge or lack of knowledge. But remove him from this. If it's anybody else and, and things were brought to light, obviously that would be part of the evaluation of someone. Uh, but I can't, I can't critique his performance or lack of performance because I don't know the specifics of all of these cases. So I can't, I can't say that. So am I happy? I'm happy with the education my, my children have received. Nick Hadley. Well, all I can say is if there was a pastor and people within the congregation that knew, shame on them. Because they may not be in the school system, but they have the right to come and say this is going on. 
And unfortunately, David Cox is in charge of way too many schools, not just one, where he actually may not be able to be privy, privy to absolutely everything, okay? Uh, I have worked with David for four and a half years. I have seen how dedicated he is to the school system. He wants to make sure that it flourishes. He wants to make sure that the classes for AP, for college and career, for the, the uh, career center, that they flourish. He is constantly at meetings. He wants to make sure that if it is something that can come to our school system, that it's here. He has embraced the Chinese Immersion Program. It is flourishing. It is doing fantastic. Um, if I had to evaluate David Cox, which I have done on numerous occasions in my past tenure, I have been critical of certain things, but that's any employee that you have that you're going to be critical of. But overall performance with the way he treats this uh, school system, it is top-notch, number one priority for him. And is he going to screw up? Yeah, he's human. People are going to screw up. He's going to do things that we may not like. But that's when we take him aside and say, you know what, you need to straighten up, you need to change things here, and we've done that. Uh, as a seated board member, we have pulled him aside and said, you need to fix this, you need to change this, okay? So I have to give him, I may not give him an A, but I'm gonna say he does the best he possibly can with what he's got. Thank you. Carbon Jackson. Thank you. Um, I cannot judge um, the, Dr. Cox based on what I know. Uh, there's just too much I don't know. I don't know the facts of the situations, how they occurred, but I do know also, and um, I hate to deal in, in gossip and rumor. Uh, so the gossip and rumor I've heard is that some things have been going on in our school system for years, and that it may not just be froth. It may not just be um, in Frostburg, and. So I can't lay that at the feet of him knowing that there's a lot more out there. Adults now that should be speaking up have not been. So I just think it's so much more to the equation than I can, can identify. As far as Dr. Cox, I've worked well with him. Uh, I've gone to him for many occasions with uh, situations. We work together on developing diversity education in our local schools. Uh, we've had some individual student problems. I've never had problems with getting to him to address them. So I don't have a negative experience in working with him. And I cannot judge the experience that you're, uh, that's before us. But I can say this. Um, I have a vast amount of experience uh, working with students for over 34 years of my life directly. I worked at Illinois State University and Frostburg State University. I worked with a kaleidoscope program with kids who were um, awarded to the state. Uh, I work, I am uh, the chairperson of the Allegheny and Garrett County's Foster Care Review Board system. They now call it the uh, Citizen Review Boards. I have a vast experience of dealing with students who are special needs in various uh, situations. We don't have enough time here to go through it all. I said that to say this. I'm very good at identifying a problem and coming up with a system of response. And if given an opportunity, I will do just that. Morgan Mayer. So I don't think it should be taken lightly that this sounds like a problem with the reporting system. Um, mandatory reporting is mandatory for a reason, and it sounds like that's not what has happened with this situation, um, which very much so needs to be addressed. Um, based on whether Dr. Cox knew anything um, and didn't do anything about it, I have no idea and I, I don't think anybody really does. Um, so that's not my place to judge him on that decision. Um, I'm going to echo Deb and say that I am extremely happy with the education that I received in the county public school system and the majority of that was under Dr. Cox. Um, so am I happy with every single decision he's ever made? No. Am I happy with every single decision anybody else has made? Probably not. Um, but overall, I think that our, the children are receiving an extremely valuable education, and I don't think that that should go unnoticed. Um, however, I do want to echo that the reporting situation absolutely needs to be addressed. Thank you. Snake Robertson. <coughs> I think that the law should have been carried to what it needed to be did, done. 
and that the outcome would have been what we wouldn't be talking about now. I am not here to ridicule or take sides or make a suggestion on what I think is right. Uh, in the experience that I've had with Dr. Cox, and it comes to education, which that's my priority number one. I'm not worried about your family life and everything else. I'm worried about education. And the cooperation, that's a big word, that I've had with the Board of Education, the County Commissioners, and the Chamber of Commerce, and businesses that donate time and effort, I cannot say is the best in this country. We wouldn't be where we are today. We're lucky to have the Career Center as the number one career center in the United States ever to have union apprenticeships in the public school system. Number one, 30 college credits now at Allegheny College of Maryland if you go through the apprenticeship. Nobody else has that around here. Go to Baltimore, they don't have it. This stuff has all come about here in Allegheny County because of cooperation with people, being to talk to people. You know, when you're on your own time, I don't really care what you do, okay? Am I concerned about how it's being controlled in that? Yeah, but there's rules, there's regulations, and there's laws. You know, what they say, let's, let's don't rewrite the Constitution, let's just reread it. You know what I mean? It says what it says, and, and let's go with that. Let, let's worry about the kids, let's get them an education, and let's get them out in the future to make something of themselves. Thank you. David Vaughn. I had to put my glasses on so I could see my notes. <laughs> I hate that. So now we're all back to what I said earlier when we started, that uh, somebody had to know, and apparently somebody did know. So <clears throat> here's the thing. It's true. The board hires one employee, and that's the superintendent. So shouldn't that superintendent have the expertise to you know, fix the problems and fix the, and, and actually get an A. Somebody said they wouldn't give them an A, they'd give them a B, maybe not an A because nobody's perfect. But if you're paying somebody uh, over $200,000 a year for their expertise, then they should be able to handle that. The second thing I would say is that what's happened is the, the, the superintendent is hired by the board to take direction by the board to implement ideas as they should be implemented in a school system because he has the expert or she has the expertise. But what's happened is, is it's been reversed. And now the board seems to be taking direction from the superintendent. And what the community wants isn't happening. So couldn't we hire a local person, somebody without doing a search, somebody that was a principal of a school here already, somebody that knows our, I grew up here, I went to K-12 to in Mount Savage. I'm a product of Frostburg State and Allegheny College. Um, <laughs> And I've taught at both of those. I've taught at Allegheny, I've taught at Frostburg. There's a lot of people who have been principals, vice principals in this county already who could do a pretty good job of managing just 13 schools. Uh, one other thing that uh, uh, Snake said there on the end is family life, he's not interested in it. But the problem is, is that family life is directly associated with education. You can't send a kid home with homework if their house is full of you know, dog poop all over the floor and they're not being fed and they don't have a clean bed to sleep in or clean clothes to wear to school the next day, that kid's not going to learn no matter how great the teacher is. So we need to look at it from a social environment as well, which is what I said about social workers. It's, it's multi-pronged. Multi Thank you. All right. Uh, we have to get to the one-minute closing statements here. Before we do, though, I wanted to get maybe a show of hands. After listening to nine people who care, and that's what you guys are, nine people who care about our kids, do we need to put into effect a review of the Title IX investigations uh, or uh, requirements? It, 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 after what Mac has brought up here and what I've heard from the panel, it sounds like we're not looking in to how the mandatory reporter is being enforced. Because I can't recall anybody that was held accountable for what happened. And if what Mac says, and I have no reason to doubt Mac, then we need to investigate the investigation. Uh, agree or disagree? Hands up or hands down? Agree. 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 Okay, well. I need more information. Say maybe. Okay, maybe. We get but there is okay. Yeah, we're leaning in that direction, and most say yes, okay? 
Uh, let's go to the closing statements, uh, 60 seconds each. We will start with Wayne Foote. Uh, I'm drawing who, who may who, who, who may get the reputation of Mr. School Bell after this? <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Okay. Uh, when I ran for the first time for the school board, I was out front saying I wanted transparency. Running the second time, yes, that's definitely. Also, I promised the people that if you elect me, I'm going to have town hall meetings. I had six. One of my meetings, I had over 100 people at. I never had one of those town hall meetings that did not have under 25. Covered Mount Savage, Cumberland. I can't remember where they all were. You know, 29, the mind doesn't work. But I would take, I had a recording secretary. She would take the notes from the people talking. I would take them and I would hand them out to my board members. This is what the people want questions for. I think a lot of times they were just kind of thrown off to the side and really not looked at. So I continue to want to have town hall meetings. If I'm elected by the people, it's for the people and representing the people. Thank you. Deborah Frank. Always so surprised when the bell doesn't ring. I'm sorry, Wayne. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, the question I received most since February 22nd when, when I um, applied to, to run is why. Why are you running for the Board of Ed Education? And it starts first with having the heart of a teacher, which is what I've done professionally for over 30 years. I think there's a perspective you have when that's your job all, all the time. Um, I have, as I mentioned, two children that, that really progressed through the school system. I would get frustrated that so few students didn't or wouldn't or wouldn't get involved. So that was one reason why I chose to run, to see why parents and students aren't getting involved. Rayel mentioned volunteering. I know there are tons of people that would be willing to do that. They just don't know what to do. So that was one reason. The second is that I have developed a program at the college that's been incredibly successful. Um, so I can look at things in a different way. I am fiscally responsible. Uh, the folks that work with me will tell you that I am intensely inqui inquisitive. I am direct. Um, and so I hope you vote. <laughs> oh my gosh, June 26th. <laughs> Nick Hadley. Ladies and gentlemen, you've seen and heard a lot of stuff here this evening, so uh, when there's 10 candidates, it's kind of hard to pull out the certain one that you might want to lean toward. One may say something good, the other one may not. Um, I can assure you that I'm here for the right reason. I'm here to see that children succeed. And the one reason that I'm sitting here right now is I have an almost two-year-old son at the house watching right now. Hi, little Benjamin. Uh, he actually is sitting there probably just throwing stuff around. But um, he is my number one concern, and he is the main reason that I decided to step up. In January, I was appointed to this board by the governor. Um, he saw what he liked the first four years I was on there and apparently wanted to see it continue. I recently have been educator recommended by the ACEA, and they must see what they like. So all I'm saying is I'm here for the right reasons. I have made sure that the teachers were number, pri number one priority while I was on the board before and continue to do that and seek to do that. And the students, I want to make sure that I'm going to take a few extra seconds. Um, that the students have every program that they possibly can, and I want to make sure that my son has the best education possible, and that's why I'm here. Thank you. Okay, Carmen Jacks. How many seconds do I have? Six. Six. Oh, okay. <laughs> um, I just want to bring home my overall goal <laughs> for working with our students and young people. We are not all on a level playing field. We do have to consider their home life. We have to consider um, if they're being fed properly, treated properly, if they have the necessary uh, things to go to school with, if they got food before they come to school. There's a lot of things that make a difference and impact our children. I want to develop a community. I want our schools to be the center of that community, the vein of the community. And if we close any of them, we are sending our kids a scattered directions. And I want our youth, our young adults, to have a place to be and things to do in this community other than hang out and possibly get into 
other problems. So I think we have to look at the overall person. We have to look at the entire community and not isolate one part of it. Thank you. Morgan Mayer. So I think it's really evident that there are some things that are going really well in the school system and there are some things that may need adjusted or changed um, for whatever reason. Um, when I served as a student member of the board, I became so immensely passionate about education, especially education in this county um, and public service in general. Um, I believe in the school system in this county and I believe in this county overall. I think that the school system is going to and needs to play a crucial role in becoming a selling point of Allegheny County, making sure that when we're talking to businesses out of the area and trying to get them to come here, we can really sell our schools because they are good and they deserve to be showcased. Um, but I still want to make sure that the students are being treated properly. I want to make sure they have a safe environment to go to school in. I want to make sure that they're in proper learning environments with ample opportunities to become college or career ready. And I think that that needs to be the heart of what the board stands for. Snake Robertson. <laughs> I want to say thank you to all the businesses, the Board of Education, and all the people that I've had the opportunity to work with in the past 18 years in this county to, be, to, be, to bring programs forward to the, give these kids a chance, whether through apprenticeships, nursing, the availability with Allegheny College of Maryland, and the scholarship programs with the focus on the future, leadership Allegheny rising, Focus on the future. It just goes on and on. And the reason I'm here is I still want to continue to give something back to this county with the kids for the success that I've had for the education and the knowledge, altitude, skill, and knowledge, ask, that I've had, and I want to give it back to the county. So may God bless everybody, and God bless the USA. Thank you. David Vaughn. Quick summary. I'm against closing any of the elementary schools. I'm not against redistricting and balancing things out. I'm all in favor of must, absolutely must, increase our school security. We have to look at our open schools, the open air schools, and secure them. So it has to happen. We can't have a tragedy like that here. We need to decrease the bulletin, bullying and eliminate bullying by doing something active about what's happening, not talk about it. And that's where the, the alternative school could come in. We need to bring mental health professionals into our system because as I said, family life and education can't be separated, and you can't teach people that have emotional issues. We need to give teachers more ability to teach, and that's what I'm, I'm aiming to do. I want to take away as much as we can by law. It's been mentioned by the panel, so, and it's true. The board is very limited by state and federal mandates, but whatever, whatever can be changed, I'm all for that, and I'll do my best to make that happen. And probably most importantly, what you'll get with me is financial transparency, and you'll get fiscal responsibility. I hope I can uh, count on your vote. Thanks. Rayel Davis. I'm a lifelong resident of Allegheny County. At one point in time, I qualified as being a statistic of being a teenage mother, and I have gone on to complete graduate school level education. And that happens by... Obviously, somebody has put a passion for education within me that I would overcome those obstacles and I had adequate support to do so. I, because of that, I firmly believe every child should have that opportunity, whatever their background comes from, whatever their hardships, that they should have that opportunity towards education. My motivation for running for the board is I am a mental health professional. And with the things that are going on nowadays, it didn't come up here tonight, um, the opioid epidemic, that's the primary clientele that I serve, but also within that, I deal with sexual trauma and domestic violence and things like that that I know are coming into our schools and I wanted to be a voice for the impact that policy has on students as well as the teachers when students are coming in from those kind of backgrounds and that and I wanted to use the skills that I've gotten from all the support I have to give back to my community in that way and I wish more therapists did run for office because we come in with good communication skills and helping people collaborate to get things done thank you Bob Farrell I think anybody that knows me either knows me from being a trooper or knows me from b being with Laura Lee. Uh, as some folks might not know, my wife was on the board. She passed away November 8th uh, from metastatic breast cancer. And she had a passion for doing this. She ran once, lost, and she came back and ran again and got on the board but was unable to fulfill her term. I want to finish the job that she started. I walked step by step with her. When I was with the Maryland State Police, 
uh, I was one of the first crews on Trooper 5, and she was working then at the hospital, and I used to meet her on the helipad with patients. We always worked together. I, I really, I'm a fiscal conservative. Uh, I believe that we really need some change in the school system. Uh, I believe that we need to be represented, uh, representative of the people and of the community and do the best we can for our students. Uh, if we don't have our kids, we don't have any future. And I really, truly believe that. And I'm hoping that uh, folks will uh, look for uh, a change here. Thank you. Thank you very much. I want to thank each of our candidates personally for coming out this evening and sharing your heart and your information and what you know and admitting sometimes what you didn't know. It's important. And what you are doing is important to our democracy. I'd like to thank our panelists here this evening, our news director, Brian Gowans, Kathy Getty for First United Bank, and George McKinley, our local attorney. Thank you for tuning in to WCBC this evening. I'm Paul Mullen. You make it a good evening. Thank you all. Thanks for doing it. It's not easy sitting there helping people out. Thank you for having us.